So this is a typical power wheel vehicle battery. It is a 12 volt, nine and a half amp hour lead acid beige brick weighing in at probably just about 10 pounds. Um, it has some pretty draconian charging requirements. They want an initial charge of about 18 hours out of the box before any use. And then 14 hour charges after each use. And from what we were able to get, that gave us about a 45 minute charge at best. Some days it would last a half an hour, some days it would go 45 minutes to an hour. So I started to look for replacement batteries and as it turns out, power wheel batteries just aren't very cheap. They're about 75 bucks and then you're left with the same charging requirement. So I looked for something cheap, something that would withstand the wear and tear and something that could be easily maintained. It turns out I already have them. You probably already have them too, and that's this. We're going to put a Milwaukee 18-volt, 5-amp-hour battery, two of them, inside a Power Wheel Jeep. Let's do it. My first choice to mount the batteries to the actual Jeep was to use one of these. And this is just a simple third-party Milwaukee USB adapter. Um, it has a 5-volt USB output as well as what I assume is five volts DC power jack. The only problem is that it doesn't have any external leads, so you can't access the actual 18 volt terminals unless you open it up, drill a hole in it, add some wires and solder them directly to the terminals. There's also no real good way to mount this to the unit without opening it up as well and drilling a couple holes and screwing it into the side of the Jeep wall. Until I found this, and this is brilliant. This is a 3D printed Milwaukee battery power cradle. It gives you complete access to the 18 volt hot and negative leads of the Milwaukee battery. And it has four countersunk holes for mounting to your project already built in. So while these are definitely gonna come in handy, there are a few issues that I found when trying to mount them to the plates that I should probably mention. First, the through hole of this mounting hole is a little bit weird and I'm not sure if the designer had intended for this to be a number eight pan head screw or something but it definitely doesn't fit a 1024 or a six millimeter socket head cap screw. Um, it's no big deal you can drill it out like I did and the plastic responds to the machining pretty easily. Second you can see how the back of the unit has been printed with a definite curve to it. And I'm not sure why, and again, it's not that big of a deal, but I could hear the plastic begin to stress as I started to tighten down on the screws before I realized that it wasn't completely flat. Um, I shimmed it up with a couple washers and that took care of it. Just keep that in mind if you're using these and you mount it to anything flat as well. I decided to use Molex type plugs to connect my components together. It makes it easier to disconnect everything once they're mounted inside the vehicle if there's a problem later. Again, this is totally optional. You could just connect the cradles directly to the DC controller with fork terminals or just the bare wire if you want to. If you're using any kind of male-female connectors, it's always good practice to use the shrouded plug on the side of the circuit that has power and the open, unshrouded receptacle on the other side. This way, if the connector happens to open inside the vehicle, the hot lead isn't exposed and it's protected from arcing against the negative ground chassis. I also added an inline ATC fuse holder to each battery. They connect to the clip's output lead via Molex plug and have a fork terminal to connect the battery to the speed controller. Even though the controller is internally fused, they'll help protect the batteries and wiring if anything should short or otherwise go haywire. Because the plastic wall of the battery compartment is a bit thin, I decided to make a few plates for the battery clips to mount to. These are just some scrap pieces of 3.8 CPVC sheet stock that I had on hand. There's four 1024 tapped holes for the battery clips to thread into, 
and then two countersunk holes for a quarter 20 flathead bolt to mount the plates to the inside of the compartment. You could definitely skip this and just mount the clips directly to the vehicle, but the mounting holes on the clips are grouped together fairly close, and I felt like it can use a little reinforcement. On the other hand, if you'd like to copy these plates and make some of your own, I'll put a link in the description to a PDF of the SOLIDWORKS drawing I made for the part file. A dab of dielectric grease will hold the shim washers in place while the battery is mounted to the clip with a few 1024 socket head cap screws. If you do decide to use these clips, be careful not to over tighten the mounting screws. Even with the shims, I could hear the plastic start to stress with just minimal torque from the T handle. The first step to mounting the battery clips to the vehicle is to remove the old battery hold down. Next, I used the plates as a template to mark the location of the mounting holes and then drilled two holes for each plate into both sides of the battery compartment for the quarter 20 screws of the mounting plate. Working from the outside of the vehicle, each plate is then simply attached to the vehicle inside the wheel well with a fender washer, a lock washer, and a nut for each screw. The last thing I wanted to add was a speed regulator. The Milwaukee batteries are 18 volts while the stock unit is only 12 so there would be a decent increase in overall speed to the wheels. While I'm sure my kid would love it, there might be a time when her friends will want to ride and while well, their parents might not be so cavalier with their kid's safety as I am with mine. So to make everyone happy I'll use this. It's a simple pulse width modulated DC speed controller. It's a nice and compact unit, it has a basic pot to adjust the output, and it's internally fused. Now you can always bypass using a speed controller and just wire the batteries directly to the motor leads. It's your call. You know your kid's mom or their dad better than I do. What I do know is that my wife certainly isn't going to feel so Ricky Bobby about it when I casually mention, Oh, by the way, I souped up the kid's toy car. It's about 50% faster now. See ya. So for 16 bucks, it's worth it to hedge my bet in the imminent argument. And it's also a fairly convenient place to terminate all the battery leads together. So it's a win-win. This is probably a good time to talk about wiring configuration options for batteries. In the parallel configuration, which is what we'll be using for the Jeep, the positive lead from each battery will be joined together at the positive terminal of the controller. And the negative lead from each battery will be joined together at the negative terminal of the controller. Batteries configured in parallel keep the available voltage the same, but increase their overall capacity. In the series configuration, the available voltage multiplies by the number of batteries in use, but the overall capacity remains the same as each individual battery. Wiring the unit is fairly simple. The battery leads attach to the positive and negative terminals of the controller marked with a P, and the motor leads attach to the terminals marked with an M. In the wiring diagram above, F1 and F2 are the fuses for each battery. I'll add links in the description for the wiring diagram as well as both configuration examples. The only thing left to do is to mount the speed controller into the vehicle, and I had to opt for some Velcro tabs. I have to admit I'm not too happy about my choice here, but the controller housing is so close to the internal board that there's no good way to mount the unit. They'll make do for now, and maybe I'll follow up after I figure out a better method. After the leads were connected and neatly tucked away, the unit was ready. But something was missing. Something, something extra. extra.
In order to gauge any potential improvement, I'll run some speed tests. But I first need to set a baseline of the stock battery. So I removed the new batteries and reinstalled the stock unit into the machine. To be fair, we know that the stock battery is at the end of its life, so the best I could do was to test it immediately after a 14 hour bench charge to give it a fair shake. This test shows that the stock battery produces 380 feet per minute or 4.31 miles per hour. And we'll use this going forward as our baseline for the other tests. Next, with the Milwaukee batteries reinstalled and the speed controller set to approximately 40% output, the new batteries produce 385 feet per minute or 4.375 miles per hour, which is roughly equivalent to the stock battery's output. It might look like the controller is set exactly in the middle at 50% output, but the knob actually goes past the highest setting on the nameplate. With the controller set at the Don't Tell Mom setting of the nameplate, which is approximately 80% of its maximum output, the Milwaukee batteries produced 587 feet per minute, or 6.67 miles per hour. This is a 54% increase in speed over the stock battery baseline speed of 385 feet per minute, or 4.37 miles per hour. Like I mentioned earlier, the potentiometer on the speed controller actually goes beyond the highest setting of the nameplate. This is because the controller is so small that at full output, the knob ends up pointing off the lower edge and somewhere in the space. And to be honest, it was the end of the day and I couldn't think of anything funnier than don't tell mom. Anyway, at 100% output, the controller produces 625 feet per minute, or 7.1 miles per hour. This is a 64% increase in speed over the maximum output of the stock battery. So that's about it. The batteries are secure, they charge in about 90 minutes instead of overnight, and they boost power by nearly 65%. It turns out that the speed controller was a pretty good idea as well. At full speed, it's easy for her to overcorrect her steering and end up in the neighbor's grass. On the other hand, she's also mastered the art of the power slide and can drift her way around some tight turns. So to keep her off the neighbor's lawns and for my wife's peace of mind, the kid doesn't even know about the speed controller, and I just keep it set at around 75% output all the time. So until next time, subscribe, and check the description for the links of the components I used in this project. Booyah! See you next time.